the context of U.S.-China competition, the term China model is widely equated with autocratic rule and perceived as a soft power challenge to the Western liberal model. Western commentators invoke the term to argue either that China's development is a threat to the world or the model is dead and China is crumbling. Today, we're going to step back and unpack the China model with the understanding that that's not an actual blueprint designed and executed by a group of leaders in Beijing, but a contested narrative with different observers offering different conflicting snapshots. Then I'm going to offer you my own account, a grand model that encompasses all the other snapshots. I call this directed improvisation. When did the idea of the China model become salient in the West? This chart shows mentions of the term China model in five influential Western outlets. Two dates stand out. 2008, the year the U.S. financial crisis struck, and 2012, when Xi became paramount leader of the Communist Party. In 2004, writer Joshua Ramo wrote an influential essay positing the Beijing consensus as an alternative to the Washington consensus. In China, some disagreed, arguing that there was no such consensus. Perceptions changed after 2008. That year, the U.S. financial crisis exploded and Beijing hosted the Olympics. Among Chinese policy elites, the idea that China has a system as good as, if not better than the West, gained greater credibility as the merits of American capitalism was called into question. Still throughout the 2010s, the Chinese leadership at the time, Hu Jintao and Wen Jiabao, was careful not to adopt the term China model, which was coined by the West and not by Beijing. Under Hu Wen, the official position was that all nations should follow their own path and that the China model, if there was one, is too unique to be replicated elsewhere. Yet despite Beijing's cautious tone, celebratory terms such as the China miracle and China's golden age became popular amid a rising tide of pride and confidence after 2008. Xi's rise to power in 2012 marked a sharp turning point. In 2011, China overtook Japan to become the world's second largest economy. This soon coincided with signs of democratic crisis and decline in the West, notably Trump's election victory and Brexit in the UK in 2016. Breaking from Deng Xiaoping's tradition of lying low and never taking the lead, Xi projected desire to become a global superpower. At the 19th Party Congress in 2017, he proclaimed, China is blazing a new trail for other developing countries to achieve modernization. It offers a Chinese solution to solving the problems facing mankind. The West interpreted his message as a soft power challenge, an ambition to spread authoritarian values around the world underpinned by economic success. Move over America, writes the Washington Post. China now presents itself as the model blazing a new trail for the world. Xi appeared rather surprised by the allergic reaction in the West. At another speech only two months later, he assured that China will not export the Chinese model. Despite projecting confidence, Xi was always ambiguous. He never defined what the Chinese solution consists. Meanwhile, apart from Xi, everyone has a different idea of what the China model is. In Western media outlets, the China model is equated with single party rule and state ownership and control over the economy. Others believe it is all of the above plus export-led growth. And still others see the China model as gradual reforms instead of Big Bang reforms. One of the most glorious interpretations of the China model is that it is meritocracy, 
a political system that selects elites purely by merit and not by elections. How can we make sense of these multiple conflicting narratives? Like the proverbial tale about the blind man and the elephant, all of these narratives contain some truth, but none of them is complete. Each of them touch on only one aspect of Chinese development. Because China is a large and fast-changing country, depending on where and when you look, China can fit virtually every model. Consider, for example, the experience of Blessed County, one of the most prosperous counties in Zhejiang province, featured in my book, How China Escaped the Poverty Trap. Between 1978 and 1993, when private capitalism was still forbidden, this county relied on collective enterprises, which were owned by village and township governments. Despite the lack of formal private property rights, industrial output grew 33 times during this period as collective economic units were allowed to fully retain profit. Viewed in isolation, this snapshot validates the good enough governance model, that is, Incremental improvements on the margins of a planned economy were enough to foster growth. But the story doesn't end here. Between 1993 and 1995, as Beijing further liberalized markets, the county government privatized collective enterprises en masse. Although the lack of private property rights had not prevented industrial production from taking off, it hindered expansion. By facilitating privatization and leaving private entrepreneurs alone, local officials supported the emergence of the county's first generation of private entrepreneurs, several of whom went on to become globally competitive corporate titans. This second snapshot validates the Washington consensus, the belief that private property rights and a limited government are all that is needed for capitalism to succeed. No need for strong government action, industrial policies, or urban planning. Moving into the first decade of this century, as local industries flourished, the county became congested and chaotic. This led private businesses to call for government intervention to coordinate the zoning of various industries and to provide urban planning. To do so, the local leadership had to relocate factories and residents, sometimes through coercion. But this forceful step created a new business district in the heart of the county, where companies could congregate. This move stimulated the spread of services such as financial management and marketing that helped industries upgrade. It also vastly improved traffic and the quality of residential life. Such extensive measures took the county's prosperity to a new level, not simply by increasing GDP, but by transforming the economic structure. This third snapshot from 2000 to 2010 provides evidence for the developmental state model, the idea that heavy state intervention is necessary for growth. So as you can see, in one small area of China with a population of less than a million people, it is possible to observe three radically different models of development, each of which played an important role in the area's economic and social transformation. Snapshots that prevailed in certain locations at certain points in time are all valid, but they are not the full picture. The real China model, if there is one at all, is the underlying governing system that enables constant adaptation within China. That is what I call directed improvisation. Recall when Deng Xiaoping took power in the 1980s? He launched a hidden political revolution, placing partial limits on power and replacing Mao's personalist dictatorship with a collective, pragmatic leadership. With that political foundation in place, he went further to change the roles of the central and local governments. 
the central government transformed from a dictator to a director. No longer did it micro-plan the economy and told local governments exactly what they should do. Instead, it directed by first setting clear, broad directions on where the country should be heading, Deng declared. Development is the heart principle. That means that the entire nation should devote itself to pursuing GDP growth no matter the cost. This broad direction, determined by Beijing, is then translated into concrete targets and rewards for tens of thousands of local politicians. The central government also directed by designing national programs of reforms. In the 1990s, Deng's successes, Jiang Zemin and Zhu Rongji set out on this mission under the banner of building a socialist market economy. They simultaneously reformed a wide range of domains, shutting down state-owned enterprises, centralizing tax collection, creating new regulatory agencies, all with the aim of creating a modern state apparatus fit for a global capitalist economy. The effect of these centrally designed reforms is like building an institutional and regulatory infrastructure for the entire nation, something that local governments cannot do on their own, much like governments laying public roads that private companies would not do on their own. At the same time, the central government decentralized and delegated authority to local governments across China, empowering them to kickstart economic development in ways that are tailored to local resources, institutions, and advantages, and to solve new problems that arose as the economy grew. This is a method that I term simply using what you have. A good illustration of using what you have was Deng Xiaoping's exchange with Xi Zhongxun in 1979, shortly after China opened markets. Xi Zhongxun is Xi Jinping's father. He was perched during the Cultural Revolution and newly appointed as party secretary of Guangdong province. Xi proposed the idea of creating three special economic zones, including in Shenzhen, that would have flexibility in adopting measures to attract foreign capital and will build infrastructure to assist factories. Deng threw his support behind Xi Zhongxun, telling him, the party center has no money, but we will give you a policy that allows you to charge ahead and cut through your own difficult road. Guangdong's advantage was its geographic proximity to Hong Kong, and it used this to its full advantage. By establishing a special economic zone in Shenzhen, Guangdong attracted waves of small and medium enterprises from nearby Hong Kong looking for a low-cost production site. Fast forward to 2010s, Shenzhen has grown into a mega city of 13 million people. Once a hub for counterfeiting, foreign consumer, and luxury goods, Shenzhen has morphed into the Silicon Valley of hardware, featuring a unique modular system of manufacturing. At Huachangbei, a massive marketplace of small vendors, shoppers can buy any electronic part imaginable. And owing to the emergence of this market, inventors and entrepreneurs from around the world can create prototypes more cheaply and quickly than anywhere else. The rise of Shenzhen's hardware ecosystem has had a global impact. Startups in any country can now create their own brands, produce them in small batches in the city, and then sell to niche markets. One example is Wiko, a smartphone company founded and based in France, whose products are made in Shenzhen. Within two years, the startup captured 18% of the French market, making it the third most popular smartphone in France after Apple and Samsung. The system of modular manufacturing that sprang up in Shenzhen is upending the traditional model of global mass manufacturing, which was previously dominated by large multinational companies presiding over a passive chain of suppliers. 
None of this, of course, was anticipated by Deng or his successors or any central planner in Beijing. As the earlier example showed, the combination of top-down direction and bottom-up improvisation produce diverse solutions tailored to local conditions and stages of development. Across China, different provinces, cities, even counties evolve different models depending on their geography, history, leadership, and policy choices. Zhejiang province, for example, is the hub of private capitalism, the home of e-commerce giant Alibaba. Right next to it is Jiangsu province, which has a different model, dominated by large foreign enterprises and state-owned companies, whereas small and medium enterprises are relatively squeezed out. Guangdong's takeoff depended on its ties and exchanges with Hong Kong. Even within a single county, as earlier shown, the model keeps changing. These regional and temporal differences are the result of improvisation. At the same time, because all localities operated under the same central directions and policies, their development shared certain common patterns. For example, the emergence of construction and real estate as the key growth drivers from the 2000s onwards. Now we get to a crucial question. Is China undersea still practicing directed improvisation? I would argue that it still is. There is tremendous decentralization and even experimentation under Xi. My recent research finds that Xi encourages policy experimentation more, not less, than his predecessors despite his authoritarian turn. What is fundamentally different under Xi is that it's much harder to direct development today than it was before. As China has reached a middle-income status, it faces difficult trade-offs, industrial growth or environmental protection, real estate sales or deleveraging, zero COVID or saving the economy. When directions are unclear or conflicting, local governments are unable to improvise. In Xi's words, on eradicating poverty, we have plenty of experience. But on managing prosperity, we still have much to learn. <laughs>